This podcast features adult content not suitable for listeners under the age of 18. You have been warned. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Back to the Story, where friends come together to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus. Let's get started. The name's Ellery. Just Ellery, thank you very much. A bit short and stocky for a half-elf, with dark hair that I keep severely tamed. I prefer to blend into the background. My bright blue eyes are the only thing that draw much attention, at least at first glance. Though I've never been physically imposing, I've learned that a few sharp words and a well-placed glare will let people know when I fucking mean business. Abandoned in an Embershore alleyway as an infant, I was adopted by the half-orc tavern owner who found me. And all I've ever wanted is to be recognized as the loyal daughter that I am. First to my mother, and then, after she disappeared, to the man I've always looked up to as my father. In order to work my way up the ranks of his organization and prove myself worthy of becoming his right hand, I've honed my skills as a thief. But the sudden manifestation of wild magic has fucked up my life and shit on all of my plans. After a harrowing stint in Embershore's prison, I've begun to question my own usefulness, and the path ahead of me. But I am certain of one thing. I must claim mastery over this magic that surges through me, before it claims mastery over me. I am Bo of the mountain. I am hard to miss, because I am so big, and my kind, half ruined are not common here. A runic marking covers my chest, fiery and red, like the fire giant ancestry flowing through me. I do not know if my parents live, but I had lived alone in the wilderness for many years. The orphanage in Embershore has helped introduce me to common folk, but this town's not my home. I am imposing, but harmless, unless you harm my friends. I have been granted many second chances in life, and with the help of Aain, I wish to give those that are lost a second chance to redeem themselves too. Hello, my name is Melly Forsky. I am 18 years old, and I am average height for a human, I think. I have ginger curly hair and grey eyes, although people tend to notice my glasses more as they're quite big because, well, I need them to see. I originally grew up in White Guard, but my family moved to Embershaw when I was young so that my father could establish a trade line between the two uh, for the company that he works for. I assist him using my knowledge of Arcana with identifying magic items for trade. When I moved here, I started studying magic under philosopher Mobius and found that I actually have quite a knack for it. He recently passed away though, so now I mainly spend time in the library teaching myself. I have quite a lovely group of friends, which, to be honest, I don't know how, so I'm a bit awkward to talk to. Um, I've followed them to the end of the earth, though, uh, although doing so has gotten me in trouble on more than one occasion. <laughs> hey, my name is Calvin, son of Klein. I'm about average height for a half-orc, but I'm built like any other blacksmith you know. I have all the skin and dark hair that I don't like to fuss over, so I try to keep it short. And I'm told I wear a perpetual frown. I was raised on my family's farm just outside of Embershore, but once old enough, I began working under Donovan in the Amber Forge. Life has a tendency to throw direwolf one's way, and I found myself needing a different kind of strength. That's when I joined the Unhollowed and trained as a dark hunter. A fire burns in my veins, my heart an anvil ever alive, pounding and shaping a will to do, well, something. I hope to uncover what life has waiting for me and will jump at any chance to tug on the strings of fate. I am Vesper. Vesper Fidelis. It's obvious from first glance that I'm not quite human. I'm tall and lithe, with pale, grey-blue skin and markings on my fingers that look like I've dipped them in ink or soot. My eyes have been described as the colour of quicksilver, and I keep my jet-black hair in a tight braid. As you may have guessed, 
I am a Genasi. Born to a man with an Afriti ancestor and an heir Genasi. Unfortunately, my mother died when I was still an infant, but my father remarried a few years later to a paladin of Aiyin, goddess of redemption. Ai developed an early fascination for medicine and healing, and so my new father took me under his wing, and I have been following in his footsteps most of my life. I admit, I'm a bit emotionally tone-deaf and mostly focused on my own goals and desires. I strive to be better every day than I was the day before, and I work hard to hone my skills with medicine, magic, and blades. My father and I recently completed a temple to Aiyin, just outside the walls of Embershore, where I serve as a healer to the sick and wounded. It's all I've ever wanted. However, I do find the thrill of adventure a little addictive which I discovered because my friends have a knack for getting themselves into trouble, and I have a knack for keeping them alive. Although I tend to fixate on self-improvement, at the end of the day, there are only three things that truly matter to me. My family, my friends, and my faith. My name is Amson Armsblossom. I was born in an unremarkable town called Deadwood, to an elven mother and a human father. Although I got most of my mother's ancestry, I did manage to inherit some of my father's red hair. Despite my father's insistence that I learn the secrets of blacksmithing, I decided to follow in my mother's footsteps down the path of artistry, music, and storytelling. My family and I moved to Embershaw when I was still a child, where I met friends of all different backgrounds and honed my skills as a teller of tales. Always with a smile on my face, I look for a chance to learn about epic tales of glory, dramatic tales of tragedy, and simple, encouraging words to tell my friends and the strangers that we meet across our path. Hello, and welcome back to the story, where friends gather to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus, and today we'll hear the origins of our story, beginning with a prologue. We open in the 617th year of the Third Era. The wild and untamed continent of Severwind expands before us, its frontier and extreme weather as dangerous as its inhabitants. Along the eastern coast, the evergreens lean out to sea, their roots grasping for the salt air, as our vision is illuminated by waves, orange and yellow, crashing against the shore. Beneath these waves along this coast glow bright stones, like the last dying embers of an ever-burning fire. Welcome, friend, to Embershore. Our story has humble beginnings, as six children meet and begin to forge their bonds of friendship. Amson Armsblossom, the half-elven from Inland Severwind, began to learn to play his lute along to the stories he'd weave. As Calvin, son of Klein, the quarter orc from outside of Embershore, worked for Amson's father as a budding smith at the Emberforge. Melifortsky, a human girl, arrived from the distant continent of Western, across the Sea of Orn. Meli was the daughter of a tradesman, and was tutored in the arcane arts by a dwarf, philosopher Mobius. Ellery Goldsmith, a half-elven girl, was raised in Embershore by her half-orc adopted parents, spending much time in the Copper Sail Tavern, learning dubious techniques from voyage, a tiefling of questionable repute. Vesper Fidelis, a girl of foreign Genasi heritage, spent time with her father, discovering her faith in Aiyin while helping the injured city guards, known as the Covenant. Last, Baal, the half ruined with giant's blood, when still but a child, was just as tall and twice as strong as most men. Baal was raised in Ambalm, an orphanage run by the wandering followers of Valtimari. It was in youth that they came to know the brutal viciousness of Severwind. Calvin proved he could use the weapons he forged, while walking back home he was ambushed by a starving dire wolf. Barely escaping with his life, Calvin killed the creature with only a dagger, impressing a watcher in the woods, one he would come to know as Warden Markov. Vesper and her father Varus were ambushed by bandits outside the walls of Embershore. Vesper ran, later discovering her father was paralyzed, and turned to stone by an infamous bandit, known as the Basilisk. Varus was mostly cured with a limited alchemical supply, 
leaving his shield and shield arm solidified, earning him the nickname Stone Shield. Beyond the northern gates, Ellery and Ball were attacked by a blood-crazed hawk, and then were chased by a monstrous wolf with glowing green eyes and horns. The Gate Covenant with Ball were able to take this creature down, what they discovered to be a Volrin, a cursed creature. Recovering some weeks later, the group enjoyed the sunshine and waves of the beach, when the warm sun reflected something in the air. Far too large to be a bird, the creature circled back towards the group as they ran from the beach into the woods, Calvin carrying his and Ellery's sisters to safety. Even in the woods, there would be no outrunning this creature. As Calvin dropped the two children to hide, he separated from the rest, attempting to draw the creature away from his friends and towards him. Calvin bounded through the woods, but was not quick enough as the creature came crashing down in front of him. A large, winged creature with massive claws and bronze scales. A dragon. With no shared language, communication was difficult. However, the dragon was wounded, and Calvin was quickly becoming a skilled smith. Calvin communicated best he could that he would help, and with directions drawn in sand, the dragon flew off, and Calvin set off to forge a scale of steel. After coming out of hiding, Ball discovered a deep pitfall beyond the boulders they hid behind, noting it in his mind. Back in town, the group prepared for a trip north, towards the cliffs of Navo supposedly where the dragons lurked. Calvin forged a large steel scale to cover the dragon's wound, as Vesper collected medicinal supplies, and the others collected their gear. North, the group traveled, vanquishing two wounded half-ogres along the way, until they came to the cliffs. Under cover of heavy rain and storm, the group had trouble finding the entrance, and were seemingly being stalked by hawks and the howling of Valren. Under the trunk of a fallen tree, the group sheltered for the night. The next day, while Ball lowered Calvin to explore the mouth of a cliffside cave, the dragon burst out from the sea, four hundred feet below, flying up to meet them. The rain had stopped, but the howls of the Valren had not. The group, besides the far too heavy ball, were lifted down beneath the sea through sunken shimp and then through tunnel, to emerging in a cavern of singing plant life. Here, in the dragon's lair, Vesper healed the wound, and Calvin hammered the steel scale into the dragon as it roared in pain. While left on the edge of the sheer cliff above, Ball was attacked by a Volren, fighting for his life, alone. By the time the group returned on the back of the dragon, the Volren had gored Ball and was dragging his unconscious body into the woods. Leaping into the battle, the group dispatched the Volren, and just as it fell, a thunderous roar reverberated in the air. A massive beast with hoofed legs, two red leathery wings, and a maned head of a ram, glowing green eyes, flew straight towards our heroes. The voice of the dragon broke through the noise. Valgrith, before grabbing the half ruined and diving off the cliff, with a group on its back, away from the monster. Melly who had just caught up to the group from Embershore, watched as the dragon drove off the cliff. And so she followed. She dove towards her friends just behind the Valgrith, whose snake-like tail struck for her. She fell unconscious as the poison coursed through her, but Calvin leaped off the dragon to catch her. He broke her fall to the sea, shattering his arm in the process. With some sinking, others drowning, this was a fight for survival. As the Valgrith clashed with the dragon above, the monstrous creature shaking off the breath of lightning. But with a forceful push of energy, the dragon bolt time enough to grab those in the waters, as our heroes held on for dear life to be carried back into the safety of the lair beneath the sea. Here they would find rest in the dragon's lair, who they came to know as Orcesis. After returning to Embershore and facing the consequences of their respective parents, the group rested for a few days before accompanying Calvin to find the Tower Basalt, which could only be found on nights of full moon. Along the way, the group were ambushed by strange shifting felines, known as catacols. Past these, as Calvin and Ball led, 
followed what sparse tracks they could, a song reached the group's ears, as Ball, Calvin, and Ellery were enraptured by the beautiful singing. Suddenly they shifted and began walking towards the song. The group tried to stop them, but couldn't before the three fell through false ground and upon sharpened sticks at the bottom of a pit. A hideous harpy, with an angelic singing voice, came out as the group negotiated for the lives of their friends, merely offering to act as collateral. But in a trick, the group surrounded the vile creature, putting it down. Further into the woods, the group found a clearing, upon which sat the old stone tower, the Tower of Basalt. Inside, Calvin attempted to prove his worth to Ward Markov and the other unhallowed hunters, but a recent recruit had been corrupted, and it was agreed that she was to be taken care of before taking on a new recruit, and it would be Calvin who would prove himself by finding her, Noxtra, a wood elf from the Norse woodlands, that was corrupted by demonic blood of the savage beast, a demon teeve. Staying the night in the Tower of Basalt, Calvin geared up and found early sleep as Ellery, Vesper, and Melly searched the tower, finding a locked door. Ellery unlocked it, moving into a bedroom. But before they could sneak out, an unhallowed slayer, a drow in heavy armor, Cordia Dalal, smashed Vesper with her dark wound mace. And in exchange for not raising the conflict further, the girls conceded a small vial of Vesper's blood before finally finding a bunk to sleep in. Outside, Bol and Amson camped in the woods beside the tower, noticing a glint in the distance, finding it to be the armor of a warrior surrounded by the bodies of several slain bugbears. The human warrior had clearly been laid to rest. They found a strange jar of war paint and pried loose a war stone embedded in the chestplate of the armor. The war stone is a holy relic, carried by followers of Wolthrath, the god of war and freedom, which depicts the battles, victories, and defeats of the follower. Ball also traded his simple iron greatsword for the fallen steel greatsword, with symbols of a holy site far to the west, the mantle. The next morning, Calvin tried to sneak out ahead of the group, feeling that this was his task to complete. He would have outrun them, too if it weren't for Melly's spell, which enabled her to expediously catch up to him. Through the wilds of Severwin, the group explored west for three days, eventually descending into the deep valley whose tree boughs covered the forest, day or night, in darkness. The group found an ancient stone archway, marking the entrance into the Norse woodlands. Traveling for a few hours, the group hears the sounds of flesh-tearing and dragging, finding several boars killed by elven arrows with strange runes of a demon, the savage beast branded upon their foreheads. Following the noise further, the group watched matted black fur, wet with dripping fresh crimson, a dire wolf come forth. Immediately stepping into a skirmish between the wolf, the group fights, yet they hear the howling calls of nearby wolves and the charging of their approach through the dark woodlands. Another dire wolf, and several other wolves come, but with spell and blade they fall, leaving the group in quiet darkness. Finding a place to rest, Calvin begins his watch by boiling Hunter's Bane and drinking the entirety of the resulting bitter liquid. His eyes are open, senses home to the darkness, and he senses on death. The source reveals itself to be a ghost of the slain warrior whose body was plundered by Amson and Ball. A deal is made to return the warstone to the body's resting place, or he will return to haunt the trespassers. Continuing to track and move through the woods, a throat is cleared. One for Lona, an elven huntress. She questions why the group is here as she reveals herself to be the sister of Noxtra, the corrupted unhallowed who the group hunts. She wants Noxtra to live, and a deal is made. She will point the way to a shortcut, in exchange for misleading the elven sentinels, giving you all time to get to her first, for they will surely kill her. So, deeper into this valley, the group delves, following the directions of Ferlona, 
coming upon the dry creek bed she spoke of. The ditch is ten feet deep, ranging in width along its length, and in the darkness one can hear the gentle flow of a very small stream at its bottom. As the group walks along the edge of the ditch, the hair stands on the back of Ball and Calvin's necks. Something lurks in the shadows. Something watches. And something strikes. From the shadows come arrows as the battle commences. Wild, red-eyed, and ruined boars charge along the edge of the ditch, as well as a mass of dire boar from the south. The group rushes into action, with Calvin running ahead, the way lit by his weapons, burning with his own blood spilt. One by one, the boars are brought down, as arrows continue to fly. Calvin faces off against Noxtra, as she transforms into a massive horned beast with demonic burning eyes. The fight comes to a close as the beast is beat back, Calvin dealing the killing blow. But before reverting to Noxtra's wood elven form, her blood ignites in hellish fury, bringing Calvin down with her. Still, the group finds victory, recovering Calvin and the unconscious Noxtra back to the tower. Years fly by now, like pages in the wind. Calvin trains with the unhallowed hunters. Vesper and Ball help with the construction of the temple to Aiene, Stonehill Abbey. Melly has spent years in a fortress of books in the library. As Amson has stayed busy telling stories and performing, and Ellery has practiced her dubious skills, landing her in Embershore's deep prison for eight months. It has been almost a decade since we first turned our gaze upon these strangers. We've watched them make mistakes, learn, and grow. Yet their story does not end here. In fact, it has just begun.